And um, we're going to really get into the trenches here. And we're going to decipher food labels. And I'm also going to be talking about supplements. So we're going to kind of, you know, dive in as much as we can here. And this is roughly a a two hour session. So, you know, get comfortable, take your stretch breaks as needed. Um, But we're going to go the, the, roughly the full two hours. And that's also going to include some question and answer um, at the end. So feel free as you're, you know, thinking up some questions, you can um, put them in the chat box. I'll get to them at the end of the the session here. All right, so as Sister Fadwa mentioned, I am a registered dietitian, been doing this um, for over a decade. And food labels is a subject that a lot of people, um, you know, find to be very complicated. So I am going to really simplify things, you know, as much as I can here. um, And kind of give you the main points that we should be looking at and focusing on. All right, let me get to my next slide. Here we go. All right, so our agenda for this morning. So why even read food labels? Like, what's the point? Um, So we'll talk about that. Common pitfalls. So we have to remember, everyone, that the label is a commercial. And food companies want us to not only buy their product, but continue to buy their product. So there's there's a lot of interesting stuff that's included on labels. So we're going to kind of sort through that to see what's real, what's not. Another big question I get all the time, organic, yay or nay? So we'll kind of dive into that as well. I'll break down the different definitions of, you know, um, organic, whether we need everything organic, whether it's more nutritious or not. Then we're going to actually get into the nutrition panel itself and the ingredients. So um, as Sister Fadwa mentioned um, at the beginning of the session here, if you have any labels that you're really curious about, grab them. Um, It's really nice to kind of look through things. So as I'm presenting this information, you you can kind of see what's going on with products that you're purchasing. And um, again, at the end of the session, you know, I'll, I'll... open up for for questions. So if you're like, oh, I don't know, I I had this label, it looked good, but I'm confused if it really is. So, you know, we'll we'll take a look at that. And then last but not least, at the end of the session, I'm also going to be talking about supplements, vitamins and minerals and protein shakes. There's just so much um, in the marketplace. And especially now with with, with the COVID era, you know, so many different um, ads that we see promoting different products that are going to help us beat the virus and and so forth. So we'll also take um, a look at that as well. All right. So why even read food labels in the first place? Well, first things first, this really helps us to improve our diets. And we as the consumer really um, need to be proactive, you know, in our health. And when we are looking at the food labels, you know, by law, the nutrition panel does have to include certain information. um, And whatever we see is the truth. So I know I get this a lot from, from patients like, oh, well, how can I believe, you know, what they're saying is really what they're saying. And, you know, the nutrition panel itself, there are certain guidelines um, that the FDA has put in place that manufacturers have to abide by. So there is laws behind that. Now, as to the front of the label, as we'll talk about in just a moment, that is a a little bit more um, uh, pliable, I guess you can say. Um, So we'll talk about that. So basically, reading food labels is going to help us to improve our diets. We're going to be able to really delve deep into the different nutrition information. On the back of the food label, um, ingredients are listed. And that's really important in case we need to avoid something. So of course, as Muslims, you know, um, certain ingredients we need to avoid like gelatin and and lard and and, and things like that. And, um, you know, as a kid, I'm sure a lot of us grew up, you know, reading food labels, you know, kind of looking, am I allowed to eat this or not? And I was telling Sister Fado yesterday that one of my favorite memories actually from childhood is, and I remember this very clearly, is when Oreo cookies 
finally took out lard because before that Oreos used to have lard in it and we couldn't eat that. And we used to just kind of get by with hydroxy. And, uh, we, and as a kid, I really wanted to eat Oreos like all the other kids. And when they finally took lard out, it was, you know, a cause of celebration with a packet of Oreos. So we as Muslims, again, we many of us already are looking at ingredients anyways. Um, so that's good. But also for those that have allergies, we are definitely seeing a rise in allergies. So that's really key too, um, to see, you know, what is in the ingredient? Is there anything I have to avoid? For those that have um, allergies to nuts, um, manufacturers even will list on the bottom um, of the label, even if there's no nuts in the product itself, the list on the, on the bottom of the label that, you know, manufactured in a facility that does process nuts, because some people are very highly sensitive to even the dust um, of, of, of nuts. So that's really key. Also, what we're going to dig deep later on is certain nutrients we need to look at because we do have to cut back and kind of limit certain nutrients as, as much as possible, like saturated fat, trans fat, sodium, especially those that have high blood pressure are really cognizant of sodium. But actually all of us should be, you know, looking at sodium and I'll be explaining further um, why that's the case. And sugar, that's a huge one, huge. So we'll get into that in, in detail. And um, really quickly, I earlier this, wow, we're already, you know, almost at the end of this month, but at the beginning of, of the new year here, actually on January 1st, I did do a session on Nutrition 101 that actually talks about these different nutrients. What is saturated fat? How much do I need? Portion sizes. So if you didn't get a chance to, to check that out, I actually really recommend that. And because I really kind of laid a foundation on a lot of the things that I am going to be talking about today. So the recording is online, so feel free to, to check it out soon, um, where I'm, again, going to explain different nutrients, you know, and, you know, kind of talk further about what their role is in, in the body. All right. All right. Okay. So very key for us to be aware of is that the nutrition label, especially the front, is an advertisement, right? Manufacturers, companies really do what they can to make that label look very enticing, to draw us in. There's a lot of psychology actually behind it. It's a whole field called industrial psychology that really kind of looks at, okay, like what catches consumers' eyes, their interests, even where products are placed in the grocery store is very strategic if you ever, um, you know, take note. Like, for example, the cereal aisle. Notice, where do they usually place children's cereal? Has anyone ever noticed that? It's usually eye level to the child, right? So, Child's, you know, with parent at the grocery store, they're, you know, walking along, they turn over and right next to them, they see, oh my gosh, you know, Tony the Tiger or whatever, you know, um, cartoon or um, mascot for some of these products. And then, right, the it starts, I want this, I want this, I want this, right? So yes, of course, where things are placed is very strategic. And even at the checkout stands, right? Those are impulse buys, if you notice, right? They'll have candy there, gum, tabloids. You know, nowadays, I know it's a lot different, obviously, because of COVID, but, you know, um, even pre-COVID, people usually are on the phone, so a lot of times that's not being looked at. Um, but those things are there. And I remember once I was um, in, a, in a county uh, further south from here, and in that neighborhood, people are, are a lot more health conscious. So I noticed I was at the checkout stand and I looked to the right and usually where candy is, I found like a refrigerator case of like individual servings of salad. And I was like, wow, I wish I took a picture of it. This was a couple of years ago. Because in that neighborhood, since people were more health conscious, they weren't buying those like candy and things like that impulse items. So that's why they put these healthy stuff uh, in, in that area. So again, just be aware where things are placed are very strategic. And the best thing to do when at the grocery store is to try to shop the perimeter. So for example, you enter the grocery store, go all the way to the far right. Usually what does one find, right? Depends on your grocery store, but usually like produce, 
right? Um, and then you round it around the corner, you'll find, you know, the dairy, the meats, the seafood, you round around that corner, and then you get into like the breads and yeah, the bakery, you know, so it's not all always great, but it's the essentials that are on, on the perimeter. So that's really ideal. It's just if you're in a rush, which I know a lot of us are these days because of the current um, situation. So, you know, just, just go around the perimeter, grab your things and, and, and get out. It's the inner aisles that a lot of times have those foods that are a little bit more enticing. And then even like the music that's played in the grocery store, they've done research on this. You know, it's like slow music because they want people to kind of peruse the aisles. Um, so again, there's a lot of, you know, psych psychology, you know, behind this. And as we get um, deeper into the food labels, I'll be talking about that. Um, so I'm actually going to turn my camera on really quick. And I want to actually show you, I have like this whole collection um, of, of food labels and actually have more um, at work that I don't have with me. But for example, and I'm not endorsing any products, by the way, I'm just showing you, whoops. Sorry, guys, let me go back to my previous slides. Okay. So again, I'm not endorsing any products. I'm just showing you guys. Okay, so this is pizza. It's called cauliflower. Cauliflower. <laughs> um, crust made with real cauliflower. Pizza, your favorite vegetable. <laughs> Right. So again, they're kind of like drawing us in. They pull on our heartstrings like, oh, my goodness, pizza's vegetable now. I'm going to buy this. Wow. It's gluten free certified. So there's a lot of things which we'll look at, you know, to, to get us in. Another one here. Organic chickpea puffs. Vegan white cheddar. USDA organic. Right healthy snack here. Um, peas, peas love and giving back. I had another one. Um, I don't have it with me, but um, on that label, it was um, for crackers and it was ancient grain crackers and um, with probiotics. And then if you purchase this product, you would help the Peruvian children, 1% of proceeds would go there. So it's like, again, they're pulling on our heartstrings. They make it look really good. Sometimes when you buy these products and you make them at home, you're like, how come it doesn't look like how it looks on, on the front of the label? Um, because again, just remember, this is, you know, marketing. Um, they want us to be, you know, really dedicated to their product, right? So let's go further here. So keep that in mind. Labeling. Now, a lot of times they put what's not there in the first place. So for example, gluten-free. All right, this is a big thing right now, huge. I mean, it's been a big thing for a, a few years now. So let me just break this down to you. So gluten is a protein and it's found only in wheat, rye, and barley. All right, so only wheat, rye, and barley products have gluten. Other products, for example, like oats, might get contaminated by gluten if they're manufactured, again, in, in the same plant or they're processed in the same plant. So they'll indicate that on there. But truly, only wheat, rye, and barley will have gluten. Now, what's happened over the years due to genetic modification, cross-hybridization, is that we are seeing higher content of gluten in these grains than we did previous. So wheat of today is not the wheat that our grandparents ate. It is different, right? Now, gluten, we hear a lot about this, like, oh, gluten's bad and this and that. And again, the jury is kind of in and out about this. Um, some people legitimately should not be having gluten. And those are people that have celiac disease. So people that have celiac disease, gluten essentially mounts like an allergic reaction in a way. Um, to their body. So they cannot have any gluten. And there's also gluten even in like cosmetics and you know lotions and things like that. So for people who have celiacs, they have to be very vigilant about any gluten. Then there are those that are maybe sensitive to gluten, right? And the best way to know whether you're sensitive um, to gluten is, you know, try cutting out gluten, try cutting out wheat, rye, and barley products and see how you feel. Do I have more energy? Am I not as bloated? 
How about headaches? Things like that, right? But not everyone has this. And there is research looking at whether, you know, this gluten um, is inflammatory for some people. And again, you know, the jury's out on that. There's still a lot of research that is being done um, on that. Um, so I know a lot of people that kind of take it easy with, with gluten, and, and that's fine. It's your personal choice. But the reason I'm bringing this up is that just because it's gluten-free does not mean it's healthy. Because a lot of these gluten-free products, what they use is they use tapioca starch, they use, you know, potato flour, rice flour, right? So, and those are processed. And a lot of times, you know, those things that they use are not necessarily healthier and better. So again, just because it says gluten-free is not, you know, automatically telling us this is healthier and purchase this, all right? And a lot of times they put gluten-free in products that don't even have gluten in the first place. I've seen, you know, gluten-free on yogurt. I'm like, yogurt is not wheat, rye, or barley product. Why is this on here? But it's done, it's, it's not a lie, right? It, it is gluten-free. They're not lying to us. But it was never there in the first place. So people are on this gluten-free, like, everything is gluten-free is good for me. And then they're going to say, oh, wow, it's gluten-free yogurt. Let me buy this. It might not necessarily have been as better as just a regular yogurt that was next to it. So just keep that in mind. Um, Cholesterol-free. This is another really big thing. So cholesterol is only found in animal products. All right. So only animal products. If it has a mom or a dad, it has cholesterol. All right. Now, our human body does not use animal cholesterol to produce human cholesterol, all right? Our liver, so our, all of our livers are producing cholesterol. We need cholesterol in our body. It is a component of the cell membranes. It's a component of hormones. It's a component of bile, which breaks down fats. So we need cholesterol. So we never want to have like, we never want to see our lab values, zero cholesterol. Then I don't know how we're surviving. Um, we have to have some cholesterol in our body. So our liver is making it. And some of us have very efficient livers that are making a lot of cholesterol. And the raw material that our liver uses to make our cholesterol is actually fat, especially saturated fat. So for those who have high cholesterol, you need to focus on fat, not necessary cholesterol. When you see cholesterol listed on the label, that indicates dietary cholesterol. And dietary cholesterol comes from animals. Right. So when I'm eating, you know, chicken and fish, you know, I'm getting chicken, you know, cholesterol, fish cholesterol. It's all coming in. It's adding to my overall bundle of cholesterol, but that's not what my liver is using to make human cholesterol. It doesn't even make sense to do that. So um, again, if it's a mom or a dad, it has cholesterol, but we're more concerned about saturated fat. And saturated fat comes from animal products, but we also find saturated fat also in tropical oils. So I refer you to my um, previous session, the Nutrition 101, where I talk more about um, saturated fat. So I've seen this on labels. I've seen this on like corn oil, you know, other oil labels, cholesterol free. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is not even an animal product. It didn't even have cholesterol in the first place. But again, they're pulling on our heartstrings. So keep that in mind. Another thing that I see a lot is all natural, natural. So the FDA, the Federal Drug and Food Administration, um, considers all natural to mean that the food contains no artificial or synthetic substances, such as coloring agents. But it can still contain potentially harmful substances like antibiotics, growth hormones, pesticides, etc. Arsenic is natural, is that not? right? Arsenic, it's, it's a poison, <laughs> but it's natural. We find it in nature. It's an element, right? So just because it's natural doesn't mean it's necessarily good for us. Um, sugar and high fructose syrups are made from beets, corn, and sugar cane, all of which are plants, all of which are natural, right? Another thing for those that like red velvet, I hate to break this to you, but it's not all red velvet, um, but the dye that they use in some of these red velvet, you know, cakes and things like that, it actually comes from a beetle extract and it will list on their natural flavoring, natural coloring. Okay. It's not beetle blood. Don't worry, but it's like an extract of, of, of beetles. So that's natural. So a lot of times when you see natural flavorings and natural colorings, you know, again, there's a lot of room for imagination there. Um, it is coming from nature, but it may not be the nature we um, might necessarily want per se. 
So just kind of be aware of that, that it, just because it's natural doesn't necessarily mean this is, um, you know, good for me per se. Other sketchy terms, um, no sugar added. This is another big one. All right, so my friends, milk, fruit, yogurt. I forgot to indicate that on the slide. So milk, fruit, yogurt um, are carbohydrates and they do have glucose, lactose fructose. These are natural sugars that our body needs, right? Especially glucose. This is our body's number one source of fuel. So natural sugars that are coming from milk, fruit, and yogurt, starches, grains, this is fine. Okay, we're not concerned about natural sugars that's already in the products. So if I look at plain yogurt, I am going to see some sugars there. It's coming from lactose. That is fine. Those that are diabetic have to be concerned about their overall carbohydrate intake. And, you know, for diabetes, that's a whole other realm. I'm not going to get into that because not everyone here has diabetes. But for diabetics, they do count their carbohydrates. And so on the label, they will be looking at, at carbs, right? So they will take into consideration, okay, how much milk they're having, fruit, so on and so forth. But for the rest of us that do not have um, diabetes, you know, don't be worried about those natural sugars, all right? What we're worried about is the sugar that's added and if there's concentrated sugar, which, for example, we find in juice. So think about juice. If you had an eight-ounce cup of juice, how many oranges would we have to juice to get that eight ounces of fluid? A lot, right? Maybe, I don't know, it depends on how juicy the, the orange is, five, six, I don't know, but a lot. Can we eat all those oranges in their whole form? No, we can't. So that's why it's always better to have fruit in its natural form like God gave us. So juice, I am not a fan of juice for anybody. The only people I tell to drink juice is diabetics if their blood sugars are low. That's the only population I tell to drink juice. Everybody else really should try to avoid it. It's very concentrated sugar. Just have the fruit itself. The fruit has the fiber and other components in there, even the little filaments and everything. Everything has, um, you know, um, those are prebiotics and antioxidants and phytochemicals that we can't replicate in the liquid format. So keep that in mind. Even smoothies. I know a lot of people are like, oh, smoothies. Smoothies are nice and everything. The only smoothies I'm okay with, honestly, are like the green drinks where you're like throwing in more vegetables and you're pulverizing it. And then maybe one serving of fruit is in there. Then, okay, fine. But when we make smoothies and we throw all these, you know, fruits in there, protein powders, and we think we're doing good and, you know, it's, it's fine, whatever. But the thing is, is that when we drink things versus eating things, the satiation point is really affected. So we feel more satiated when we're eating, we're chewing, we're giving, you know, our receptors in our body time to really, you know, absorb uh, the nutrients and so forth. Whereas when we're drinking things, it's not as satiating. And again, we end up getting more than we normally would have been able to eat. Like think about how much fruit you throw in there. And I'm not saying fruit is bad. You know, actually, you know, having fruit at every meal is a, a good thing, but sometimes one can go overboard. So that's what we have to kind of be moderate um, about. So beware of juice. It has concentrated sugar, sometimes as much as soda. So when you see no sugar added, you see that on the label or, you know, as we see here, made with real fruit, there's already sugar in there. All that's indicating is they didn't add in any of their sugars. Sugar-free also, just be aware of that. Usually sugar-free indicates that a non-nutritive sweet sweetener, an artificial sweetener was used. We'll talk more about those a little bit later on. Um, Fat-free. So most of the time when they remove fat, they remove flavor. So they then substitute it with sugar. So a lot of times fat-free products have actually more sugar and just as much calories, if not more. Sugar-free products, when they remove sugar, they remove flavor, so they usually add more fat to buffer it. So usually we see higher amounts of fats. So it's always better sometimes just to have like the real deal and just have less and enjoy it. Because this also happens to us psychologically is when we're having sugar-free or fat-free or light, psychologically we think, wow, this is really good for me, so I'm gonna eat more. 
like we're not like consciously like thinking of it, but it's like subconsciously it's happens. We've seen this in, in their research where like, you know, people, these 100 calorie packs that came out a while ago, those are good and everything. Um, but sometimes people are like, oh, it's, it's just 100 calories. I'll have another packet. So we sometimes let down our guard because we're thinking it's good for me because it's sugar-free or fat-free or light when that's not necessarily the case. Light, we see that on a lot of products. So that can sometimes refer to flavor, not necessarily the ingredients. So for example, light brown sugar, it's just lighter in color. Doesn't mean it's better for us. Light can also mean reduce fat or reduce calories, but it can still be high because they compare it to the original product. So for example, low in sodium. So I've seen low sodium soy sauce. because Soy sauce is actually very high in sodium. Um, and then when you see low in sodium soy sauce, don't think that it's the right amount of sodium. It's just less sodium than the full version. So we still have to be cognizant of how much we're using. All right, another huge area is organic. Now, I had a friend once who was like, yeah, so I bought organic potato chips and then that place has organic coffee, so it's good for me, right? And I was like, look, just because it's organic doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna be healthier for us. So just keep this in mind, all right? So organic, when you see this term organic, we see it on processed foods, we see this on, on produce. So basically what this indicates is that when this item was grown or processed, they did not use any synthetic fertilizers or pesticides. So there's, there's actually very strict measures here in the US, and as some of you are here internationally, welcome. Um, but here in the US, we have really strict measures. And actually, to be honest, other countries, especially in Europe, have even more stringent measures. So uh, you guys in, 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 in Europe are, are doing actually really well sometimes compared to us here. Um, but in any case, um, so yes, farmers cannot use any synthetic fertilizers or, or pesticides. They're not genetically modified foods. Now the research, yeah, so far the research has shown that GMO products, genetically modified um, organisms are okay, but you know, there's still you know, a lot that still needs to be looked into further. But as of right now, GMO you know, allegedly is fine. I'm just saying what you know, is out there, but I feel like there's, a little, there's still a lot of room to, to look into. So I personally am not a fan of GMO and I try to avoid that um, as, as much as possible. And there are actually apps that you can download that will tell you what products are genetically modified. In this country, that's um, usually GMO products that are produced here are usually like soybean, um, corn, um, rice sometimes, and even tomatoes um, can be GMO. And GMO just basically means that they'll kind of like, you know, um, kind of cross-link genes, I guess you can see, say, so that you know, products can, for example, like last longer, right? So for example, if you look at tomatoes, like I grew tomatoes this past summer, it was fun, um, versus tomatoes that you find in, in the grocery store, right? You can drop those tomatoes. You can maybe like roll the tomato across the floor and it won't bruise, right? Whereas like the organic, like, you know, natural, um, non-GMO um, ones are not like that. So that's a whole separate um you know, area to talk about. Also, organic foods are not irradiated. That's another really big thing. Um, usually they irradiate products, um, you know, to uh, decrease like, uh, or prevent even growth of microbes, uh, bacteria, so on and so forth. Um, and so things don't spoil as, as fast. That's another big thing. And also um, these organic products, uh, there's no sewage, sludge, fertilizer used as well. Now, organic products have their own fertilizers and pesticides that are used that, you know, are allegedly better. But, you know, again, th this is a, a constantly changing field that needs to be looked further into. So when we see organic on our U.S. labels here, so the U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, there's a, a stamp of organic because the USDA and the FDA, they kind of uh, manage different areas. So USDA manages like all, you know, agriculture, livestock, or as FDA manages other products. So when we see 100% organic on the label, that means all of the ingredients must meet the organic criteria. So what I was mentioning before, so there, there's no synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, et cetera, et cetera. 
we see USDA organic or certified organic. So what this means is 95% or more of the products are certified organic. But the remaining 5% of the ingredients may only be foods or processed with additives on an approved list. So they may not be organic. Made with organic, this indicates that the ingredients must contain 70% or more organic ingredients, but the remaining 30% of the ingredients, you know, might not necessarily be organic, right? They may be on, again, another special um, list. And the USDA symbol just can't be used anywhere on the package, right? So there are stringent measures um, for this to, to be used. Now, organic meat and poultry. So what this means is that there's no growth hormones or antibiotics that are used, but they might use other things but, um, that, are, that are certified, but overall, no growth hormones or antibiotics. They're fed organic feed with no animal byproducts because it's really interesting and sad what a lot of our livestock, especially here in the U.S., um, are, are being fed. Right, they're 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 fed grain to fatten them up faster, and this is also what we're seeing is that when they're fed grain, we are seeing more of a higher composition of omega sixes um, in 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 their meat. And again, I will refer you to my previous session on omega sixes. But the problem with omega sixes is too much omega sixes can actually instigate. Um, inflammation. So we don't want to have too much omega-6s um, in, in our body. We want to have more of the omega-3s. So grass-fed, actually, which is what they should be eating, right, grass, um, we do see more of, of, of the omega-3s. Does that mean it's grass-fed, it's healthy for me? No, we still have to be cognizant of how much meat we're having, especially red meat. Um, you know, the saturated fat amounts, the cholesterol amounts, you know, and again, it is a, a, a big source of inflammation for a lot of people. So we want to be moderate um, in that. But if you are going to be purchasing, you know, red meat, which is beef and, and goat and lamb, you want to try to get, you know, the grass fed variety. Also, when you see organic meat and poultry, this indicates that the animals have some access to outdoors. Not necessarily they're living out there. They might just be out for a little bit of time and then brought in. Um, so in this picture, right, they're out, right? Cows are out, but right, they're not freely, you know, roaming around and and so forth. Um, also, this uh, indicates that at least thirty percent of the cow's diet is from organic pasture during the grazing season. So again, stringent measures here. Now, organic dairy. Now, I actually do suggest that, you know, especially for children and for those that are, you know, elderly, mature, um, to try to get organic. And even us as well. You know, to be honest, everyone should be getting organic um, dairy. So this indicates no growth hormones or antibiotics for cows. What had happened some years back is um, due to a particular hormone that they had actually injected into these cows, because think about it, these cows grow in very close quarters, so they can get each other sick. So that's why they're giving them antibiotics. They are trying to get them to constantly be lactating, right? So we're getting their milk. And, you know, then they try to, you know, pump them up. So, you know, for, for the meat, and this has to be done in, in a short span of time, right? To, to meet demand. So this is why this is happening to to all these animals, and you know, again, this is a whole separate you know subject um, of the ethics behind this. Um, but what happened several years ago is they actually started. They found that a lot of young girls were hitting puberty at, at a young age, and they were able to trace it back actually to some of these hormones that were that were used, um, which you know they banned. They don't use them, but you know, a lot of this stuff does trickle down to us. So, you know, just food for thought. Um, organic dairy indicates also that the cows are fed organic feed with no animal byproducts. Cows, again, have some access to the outdoors. Same thing as the previous, at least 30% of the cow's diet is from organic pasture. And then the cows themselves have to be orga um, raised organic for at least a year before their products can be labeled as organic. Now, organic eggs. Now, eggs are very confusing, right? It's like free range and, you know, cage free and this and that. It's, it's very, um, very interesting here. So I'll, I'll break that down for you guys. Um, so 
Organic eggs, this indicates that no growth hormones or antibiotics were fed to the, to the hens or injected to the hens. The hens were fed organic feed with no animal byproducts, and the hens have some access to the outdoors. All right, so some access. So on the right-hand side, I don't know if you guys see this, on the right-hand side of my picture here, this is actually considered cage-free. They're not in cages, right? But I mean, this doesn't look like really... Um, humane practices, you know, to, to be honest. So when you see cage free, whoops, sorry, guys, sorry. Cage free, that may basically indicates that the eggs come from hens that weren't confined in cages. They may or may not have access to the outdoors though. Right. So just, you know, something to think about. And then when we see free range or free roaming for poultry or eggs, what that means was, again, the hens weren't confined in cages. They have access to the outdoors, but the outdoor area might be covered with netting. For beef that's considered free range or free roaming, that means the cows weren't confined in feedlots. They have access to the outdoors. So ideally, we would like to see, you know, free range. You know, organic, you know, eggs um, would be ideal. So again, organic um, eggs, I would also recommend as well for everyone, to be honest. Definitely makes a, a difference. You can even see it in the, in the color of the yolk. Oh my goodness, my whole slides are gone, guys. Um, so I had more to this slide uh, than this, apologies. Um, so in any case, so should I eat organic? It's, there's, it depends is the bottom line. And what it depends on is, first and foremost, what is the organic product that you're having? So if you're like, I bought organic chips or I bought organic cookies, there, it's still a chip. It's still cookies, right? Yeah, the, the products that they used in there, um, you know, were grown with those particular set standards, but it's still a chip. It's still a cookie, right? For produce, just because it's organic does not mean that it's necessarily higher in nutrient value. It is not. The vitamins and minerals that we find in organic is the same as that we find in non-organic. So I'm not going to find more vitamin A and C and so forth in um, you know, the fruits and vegetables. The, the nutrient value is the same. The only difference, again, is that these fertilizers and pesticides and so forth weren't used. And there's a lot of research looking at what are the long-term effects of these fertilizers and pesticides? What are they doing to our body? For example, um, you know, one of the, the pesticides, you know, Roundup, that's used on a lot of our produ produce and grains, right? I, I remember reading about a couple, I think in the Midwest, that actually sued Mons Monsanto, um, and uh, actually won because they both got cancer and they're blaming it on, you know, one of these fertilizers or pesticides that they were using on, on, on their crops. So again, the whole food industry, I mean, I should have a whole class on like food politics because food is very politicized. The lobbies behind food and food companies is, is huge, huge. And that really affects the, our dietary guidelines. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. I know several years ago, I think Oprah had made some comment about beef and everyone at that time used to listen to Oprah and that the beef industry actually sued Oprah because they're like, you affected our sales. So, you know, the lobbies behind all of this are, are, are pretty, pretty huge. So, you know, just keep that in mind um, that, you know, these, these companies, uh, conglomerates really, the, the bottom line for them is, is, is the dollar, right? or you know, whatever currency you're in. So um, the reason we would be, uh, be eating organic is again, to avoid that exposure to those fertilizers and pesticides and so on and so forth. Um, but the, it is more expensive, right? So, I mean, sometimes it's painful. You go to the grocery store and you're like, oh my gosh, right? I can get this for $2.99 or you know, $5.99 for the organic version, right? And it, it's, it, it can hurt sometimes, right? And especially for those that are, you know, you know, watching the, you know, their finances and so forth. For what I would suggest is take a look at how often you're eating that product, right? If you're eating it like all the time, then maybe you want to purchase organic. And um, here in the U.S., we have um, the Environmental Work Group. This is a consumer group that actually will evaluate. 
um, you know, various produce. And every year they come out with a list. It's called the Dirty Dozen. So I have 2020 Dirty Dozen list here on our slide. 2021's list is not out yet. Um, but this is a list that they put out um, of produce that we should try to buy organic if we can, because this is the highest amount of pesticides that we're seeing in produce. So for example, strawberries is, is always on that list. I always see strawberries on that list. So strawberries is number one, highest amount of pesticide value we see. So yeah, if you're buying strawberries often, the recommendation would be, you know, to try to get organic, especially if you have young children or, you know, um, elderly or those that are immunocompromised spinach, kale, nectarines, things like that. So if you take a look at these items that are on the list, usually these are thin, thin skinned, right? You will never see bananas on this list. Bananas have a pretty thick skin. So like you never really need to get organic bananas, right? Avocados, right? Same thing. That hasn't been on the list, I think, from, from what I recall. So, you know, certain fruits and vegetables, we don't need to get organic. Um, but certain we do. Now, blueberries is not on the list this year, but it still has high pesticide amount, but these have more. And again, this list is, is, is for the US. I'm not sure about other countries. Um, again, other countries, like I said, especially Europe, a lot more strict in, 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 their, in their policies, which I actually really appreciate. Um, so anyways, so at the end of the day, it really depends on you. I would suggest personally getting organic um, dairy getting organic meat um, and then trying to, you know, follow this, the, the dirty dozen for, for, the, for the year um, and trying to get those that are organic. Um, and it, what I was you know, doing um, previously with my adventures in gardening, which didn't go that far, um, is I was actually like, you know what, let me actually try to grow some of the foods that are on the dirty dozen list, because at least I know how I'm growing it. Right. So, um, I tried, it didn't really work, but <laughs> it, was an, it was an attempt. But as for other products like organic potato chips and cookies and things like that, yeah, if you want to spend the extra money and get those organic, that's fine. Um, again, because of the pesticide and, and, and fertilizer residue and, and so forth. But I don't want you to psychologically think it's better for you so that you're eating more, if that makes sense. Oh, wow, I do have everything. Okay, never mind, friends. Um, my slides kind of went all over the place today. Anyway, so here's my slide. So yes, organic produce is not higher in nutrient value, but again, less exposure to, to pesticides. All right, now, if you haven't already, go grab your label and let's take a look at the ingredients. So the ingredients usually are in very microscopic print sometimes. Um, and they can sometimes be hard to find on, on the label, but it's on the side there somewhere. Um, so you will see that on there. Let me turn my camera on here. All right. So they should have it again in small, it's either like on the back of the label itself, it might be on the side of the label. Right. Sometimes you might need a magnifying glass <laughs> to take a look at, at, at what it is, you know, but it's very key to look at the ingredients. And especially when you're running into the store, um, you know, and you don't want to spend too much time in the store, obviously, one of the best ways to triage a product is first look at the ingredients. What is going on in this product? Because by law, the manufacturers have to list what is in there. And um, the label, by the way, is, is slowly changing. I'm going to be talking about that um, coming up, but our U.S. labels are changing slowly, the, the formatting and so forth. I love the European labels. So um, reason being is in the European labels, what I love about their ingredients is we have to remember that the ingredients are listed in order of weight. So whatever is the first ingredient is what is the most of. So for example, if you pick up a cookie, Usually the first ingredient is sugar because that's what's mostly in that product. So they list them again in order of, of weight. And the reason I like the European labels is because in their ingredients, they will list the percentage. So for example, you know, you know, 47% whole grain, 46% enriched flour. And when you see things like that, if you look in our U.S. labels, it'll just say whole grain flour or whole wheat flour, and then it might say enriched flour, and they might be back to back next to each other. And it might seem like there's more of 
the whole grain item, for instance, right? But we don't know how much more of. So that's why the European labels with their percentages, and, and that's hopefully going to happen here at some point. Um, that will tell a little bit more um, to the story, but we'll deal with what we got right now here. So when you look at the ingredients, ask yourself, do I want this in my body? And this is why I always tell kids and teens, I'm like, read the label. Read the label of your Flaming Hot Cheetos, right? Read the label of some of your favorite foods. Do you even know what that is? Can you pronounce it? Do you want that in your body? Because we, you know, we are what we eat. Literally, we are what we eat. Foods can affect our genes, right? So there's a whole field of nutrigenetics and epigenetics, you know, how our lifestyle can activate genes on and off, right? Can express this. So foods can do this. Again, a lot of research. This is again a whole separate session. Um, but we have to keep that in mind. And I, I know we think, oh, it's okay, it's once in a while. And, and that's fine. But how many once in a whiles do we have, right? And I'm all about moderation, everyone. You know, that's our, our sinna is, is to be moderate. And I'm all about that. But you also have to be, you know, uh, smart about what, what we're consuming as well. So the less ingredients, the better. Honestly, if you pick something up and it's like a paragraph and you need that magnifying glass, that's a lot of stuff going on there. And that's a lot of processing. The less processed the better that should be our mantra and that's what we keep seeing in the in the literature in the research the less processed the better keep it real right um so always ask yourself how many steps from farm to table right earlier i held up these this hip peas organic chickpea puffs and you know the ingredients for this. Actually, let me read this again. I don't. I'm not knocking any products. Apologies to the manufacturer here. But the ingredients here are chickpea flour, rice flour, sunflower oil, tapioca starch, pea hull fiber, brown rice flour, salt, cane sugar, onion, citric acid, garlic, rice concentrate, lactic acid, canola oil, natural flavor, which of course again has a a very vague terminology there, rosemary extract. Then they even have little asterisks and it says organic ingredients, right? To get us again, um, pull up pull our, our heartstrings here. So when you read that, because when, when I look at the front of the label, it's, it's just basically, it's indicating that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's coming from chickpeas. But when I look at the back of the label, that's a lot of other stuff going on, right? So it is pretty processed. So we have to just keep that in mind. Right. Um, I have, you know, patients that tell me, oh, yeah, I bought chips. They're made from quinoa and black beans. And I'm like, all right, so why not just have the quinoa and black bean, you know, just by itself? Um, and they're like, but it's not a chip. But I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know, that would be better than like the, you know, white potato chips and things like that. So we have to kind of look at, you know, where we are in this journey of wellness. And my whole mantra is like baby steps, just small things, just, you know, keep moving. But the ideal would be honestly less processed, you know, more wholesome foods in their whole form would be the ideal. So when you are picking up a product, if a product has more than six ingredients, everyone take a look at your products. Does it have more than six ingredients? If it does, then what I want you to do is especially pay attention to the first three ingredients. All right. Now, the reason I'm saying that if it has six ingredients or more, then this rule comes into play is sometimes we pick up products and they have like one ingredient. So, for, for example, if you pick up oil, the only ingredient you're going to find, hopefully, is just oil. Right. That's fat. So that's fine. Right. We know what we're getting into. Um, but if you have six ingredients or more, you know, take a look at the first three ingredients and try to avoid any form of sugar, fat, salt, or enriched flours within the first three ingredients. So this is why I'm saying if it only has less than six ingredients, sometimes this doesn't work as well. Um, so again, if I pick up that oil, I'm going to see oil. And if I was following this rule, I wouldn't buy it because that first ingredient would be fat, right? So that's why it doesn't apply for um less ingredient items. But this is a really good rule of thumb. This can really help us triage when we're in the grocery store, right? You can just immediately be like, oh, whoa, sugar first ingredient. Okay, I'm not buying this bread, right? So really important. And there are, yes, my friends, there are breads out there that abide by this, right? Because think about it, everyone. For those that make bread at home, it's pretty basic, 
I remember um, pre-COVID once my mom had texted me. She's like, I'm at the grocery store and I found this bread. What do you think? And she sent me a picture of the ingredients. I'm like, mom, what is all this random stuff in there? Like bread should be pretty basic, right? Like how do you usually bake bread? Um, It's only got a few ingredients. So what's all this other stuff? Um, So in any case, um, just kind of keep that in mind, right? Um, The less ingredient, the better. Um, and again, if you see any form of sugar, fat, salt, or enriched flours, try to avoid that. And I'm going to delve in deep about different terminology that they use um, for some of these things. So when we read the ingredients, this is an example, all right? So I'll say ingredients and then um, the list them. And sometimes you see that parentheses pop up. So when you see the parentheses pop up, Ignore that, like don't count that as part of your three, first three ingredients, because the parentheses indicates what's in that ingredient itself. So for example, enriched flour here, this indicates that it has wheat flour, niacin, reduced iron, folic acid. So when we're counting the first three, I look at enriched flour, skip the parentheses, next one, sugar, next one, semi-seat, chocolate chips. Okay, well, the second ingredient is sugar, first ingredient is flour. So ideally, this isn't a product that I want to have all the time. It's like a once in a while, like, you know, kids want to have a little, you know, movie night. They want to have this cookie. Okay, fine. But this shouldn't be something in our regular rotation. Also, this has partially hydrogenated. I'm going to come uh, talk about that a little bit later. But this indicates trans fat, which we definitely want to try to avoid. All right, here we go. Now, our U.S. labels are changing. So on the left-hand side is the old label. In 2016, we were supposed to start changing. By 2018, we were supposed to have this new label on the right-hand side in play, but it's a very slow motion transition happening, you know, because of the previous administration, things got a little slow there. Um, So hopefully by this summer, hopefully, I've been seeing this for a while, um, the right-hand side here, this new label should be what we should mostly be seeing out there. But this uh, old label on the left-hand side, um, still lurks out there. Um, again, it's not too bad, but there's been some uh, improvements. And you know, myself and my fellow dietitians at work were like such nerds. When we first saw the new label come out a few years ago, we were so excited. We were so nerded out because we were so excited about the new label because it has something that we were waiting for for a while. And um, it added added sugars. So if you take a look at the uh, previous label, it just says sugars. It just lumps them all together, natural, added, everything just thrown in there. We don't know what's really going on. But the new label, it has added sugars, which really is going to give us a lot of important information. Also, what we see a change up is the formatting. So what pops out when you look at the new label? Bam, calories in your face, right? Bold. Um, Serving size. So they kind of flipped it, bolded it. Um, They added in, um, you know, the added sugars. Also, what they're doing is they're making their serving size more realistic. They standardize this across the board. So I think previously the ice cream serving was like, I don't know, some small amount. And then they kind of made it a little bit more realistic now. Serving size doesn't mean this is how much you should be eating. It just kind of gives you the guidelines of what the the numbers are that follow. So we'll get into that in, in a moment here. Um, Also, what happened um, is they took out vitamin A and C because we as a population are good with our vitamin A and and C amounts, and they added in vitamin D and potassium because these are definitely nutrients of concern. Now, many of us do not get enough vitamin D. Many of us are very deficient in vitamin D. I just got my vitamin D done the other day, and I take a supplement. I'm still on the lower end, and I was like, oh my goodness. So, you know, we really got to work on the vitamin D. Again, this is a whole separate subject because vitamin D is a very key nutrient. A lot of research looking at its relationship between uh, COVID and vitamin D and the severity of symptoms. Um, So a lot of interesting things coming out about vitamin D. Uh, And potassium, also very important. Um, We just don't get enough. And potassium really um, kind of... uh, how do you say it, bypasses, I guess, some of the effects of sodium. So for those that have high blood pressure, you know, it is important how much potassium that you're having. Those that have kidney issues, you need to be very worried about how much potassium you're having. So follow your doctor's orders, of course. Um, So certain populations, as you can see, 
right, have to be cognizant of certain nutrients. Okay. So everyone, let's take a look at your label and let's everyone, let's take a look at your serving size. So the serving size is indicated on the top, right? And here in my example actually is of the previous label, um, but it'll say serving size on the, on the top. And that tells you that all of the numbers that are underneath the calories, the fat, the sodium, potassium, the protein, all that stuff is in that amount. So in this case, it's one slice. So what do I do if I'm eating two slice, slices? I'm gonna have to double all those numbers. What if I decide I'm eating the whole container? I'm eating all this, I don't know why. Um, but then you would be having 23 servings. So you would multiply this, 23, one serving is one slice. I'm having 23 slices. I gotta multiply all of this times 23. Now, usually that's not the case. Usually we don't go that overboard. But be aware because some products do have small serving sizes and they do it on purpose to make these numbers look good to us. Like, oh wow, it's it's only five. All right, I'll have this. Not realizing we eat five times that amount, for instance. So soup cans. I see this a lot in soup cans. The serving size is like half a cup. But when people open, crack open that soup can, usually they eat the whole can, right? So then they would be having two servings. So then they got to multiply accordingly. So in my um, cauliflower pizza here, the serving size is half a pie. And the servings per container is two. So if I decide I'm eating the whole thing, I'm really hungry today, I'm eating it all. Um, then I got to make sure I'm multiplying all of this accordingly. I got here some snap peas. My original green pea crisps. Look how nice it is. It's like a little farm there. Um, and the serving size is like 22 pieces, right? So if I decide I'm watching a movie and I end up eating a lot more, again, you got to accordingly um, multiply. So just always keep that in mind. And the serving size is not a suggestion that this is how much you should eat. It's just, again, it, it's arbitrarily decided with the different manufacturing companies just as a set standard. All right. So here are some guidelines and we're going to dig deep on these different guidelines. Um, so I'll go further from there. So some of the things that we should be looking at is total fat. Right, especially those that have high cholesterol, right? You need to be looking at the fat. Uh, sodium is very key, especially those that have high blood pressure. But to be honest, we all should be looking at sodium. 90% of our population will have high blood pressure at some point in their lives, 90%. Hopefully later on in life or never, but this is a huge public health issue. Fiber, we gotta bump up the fiber. Fiber, think of fiber as like a broom for our body. It just cleanses us out. It provides good fodder for our gut microbiome. I have a whole session on the gut microbiome. Um, so it eats fiber. That's like a prebiotic. So we want to bump up the fiber. Um, total sugars. We got to be careful about how much sugar we're having. There is no nutrient value to sugar. Sodium has a nutrient value, right? Sodium is a, an electrolyte. It's a, a mineral that we need. It's a micronutrient that's very crucial. But sugar is not. There's no benefit to sugar. It's just there. It tastes good. And that's about it. Um, so we got to be cognizant of that. A saturated fat, also very important. Um, again, especially for those that have um, high cholesterol. Carbohydrates, total carbohydrates. This is what those that have diabetes and prediabetes should be looking at. Total carbs, because we do carb count. We do recommend carb counting for those that have diabetes. Usually for, for women, we recommend about 30 to 45 grams of carbs per meal. For men, about 45 to 60 grams per meal. It's really nuanced because we have to also count in you know, fruits and grains and things like that. Um, so carbohydrate, total carbs is not for the general population. It is more so for you know, diabetics and prediabetics. All right, so calories. Now, I'm not a big fan of calorie counting and obsessing over calories and, oh my gosh, I had this many calories. I am more concerned about what is the quality of that calorie, right? Where is it coming from? This is what's crucial. So if you had like, I don't know, a 250 calorie protein bar and look, if you have a protein bar in, in front of you, please look at those ingredients. It is very interesting sometimes, all the stuff they add in there. 
soy protein isolate, pea protein isolate, usually are there forms of, of protein that they're adding. That's very processed, right? And then coconut oil and this oil and, you know, uh, you know, these type of sugars, artificial sweeteners. I mean, a lot of this stuff is it's very chemically, you know, just to be, you know, honest. So just kind of look at that. Some of, yes, there are better versions of some of these, you know, nutrition bars and granola bars, you know, but a lot of them are like candy bars with chemicals, to be honest. So if you had like a, you know, a protein bar such as that, or you had like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? whole grain bread, natural peanut butter. And natural peanut butter, what that means is when you read the ingredients, the only thing you should see is peanuts. Maybe salt if you're getting the salted variety, but that's about it. Nothing else, nothing else. Keep it simple. And then maybe you had some like fresh preserves, right? And let's suppose that peanut butter jelly sandwich is a little bit higher in calorie value. Which would be better for you? Chemical protein bar or PB&J? It would be the PB&J because at least our bodies understand that. So that's the thing, you guys, is look at what am I eating, the quality of what I'm eating. That is more important than just straight calories looking at the label, all right? Now, calories are important, though. I'm not negating their importance. They are definitely important, you know, but use them as reference points. So for example, meals, we should try to keep roughly to 500, 600 calories per meal give or take. You can go plus or minus, just don't double it. So don't have like thousand calorie meals, right? That's not needed. Even for those that are very active, you do not need that boost of calories like that. Um, so 500, 600, give or take is, is a good reasonable amount. Um, snacks keep into about 100 to 200 calories. Um, and again, in my previous session, I talk about, you know, just like the quality, you know, if you're going to have a snack, a fun food, like really be a snob about what you're picking. Um, but this is very helpful, especially when we order things or when we buy things, right? If you're picking up a snack, you're like, oh, this is going to be my snack. Oh, wow. This snack is 500 calories. Well, that's a meal. So then don't have it as a snack. Maybe have half of it, right? So keep this in mind um, when we are purchasing things. Now, percent daily value is also included on the labels. I am not too much of a, I mean, I'm, I'm, like, I don't get obsessed with looking at that. Like, I'm glad it's there. That's nice. But I'm, I'm more, um, I am more encourage people to look at the actual grams and milligrams that we see in the actual nutrients themselves. The percentages are nice to look at, but just keep in mind the percent daily value is based on a 2000 calorie diet. Um, which not everyone is on, nor should everyone be on. So a lot of times these are not 100% accurate per se. But again, these are good to see if a food is high or low in a nutrient. So for example, if you pick up something and you're like, whoa, this is 100% total fat. That's a lot of fat for that product, right? So like fat, cholesterol, sodium, carbs, we should actually be more seeing on the lower side. I never want to pick something up and see 100%. Of, of those nutrients, of, of those items, because that's actually, uh, you know, too much. The ones that we do want to see high amounts of ideally would be the vitamins and minerals. Yeah, it would be nice if I saw, you know, more than 0% vitamin D, you know, more than, you know, 5% iron and so, so on and so forth. So these are just there just, again, just to kind of help guide us, but it's more important to actually look at the, the nutrients themselves. All right, so let's get to it. Fats. So overall, everyone, we should roughly, give or take, aim for about 50 to 60 grams of all fats per day. This is all fats, good, bad, and ugly, all right? And for more petite women, you would probably aim for like 40 grams, more on the lower end of the spectrum. For men, 60 grams, maybe a little bit more, but not way more. But fat is a big issue. We're getting a lot of fat in our food. So we're just going to do our best You know, do your best as much as you can to keep to 50 to 60 grams of fat. Um, and again, in my previous presentation, which I keep referring to, I talk more about like serving sizes, you know, like, like oil, like one teaspoon of oil is five grams and, you know, nuts, like uh, six almonds or five grams. So that I go more in depth in there, but um, we are just 
inundated with by fats all over. And I don't want to get into the keto diet and this and that, you know, talk about that previously as well. Um, but we are concerned about the quality of fats. All right. So if any of you are doing keto, which I'm going to be honest, I'm not really 100% a big fan of for, for long term at all. Um, just make sure you're picking good quality fats. You know, just be aware of all the saturated fats, because again, too much saturated fat does cause the overproduction of LDL bad cholesterol. So we got to be, be aware of that. So and anyways, on the label, you'll see total fat and it will be in bold print. And underneath indented, you'll see saturated fat and you'll see trans fat. Now, by law, manufacturers have to put saturated fat and trans fat. Those have to be on the label. There are also other fats that may not be included there. So for example, you see here one gram of total fat, but you're like, wait, there's zero saturated, zero trans, like where's the rest of the fat? There's also other fats, monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats that they don't have to list on the label. That might be where the fat's also coming from. And these are better fats actually. Um, so when you see total fat, we ideally want to aim for three grams or less per 100 calories. So you look at the calories, so in this case, it's 109 calories. So ideally, I would want to see three grams or less. So then I look over, oh yeah, total fat, yeah, one gram, I'm good. So for every 100 calories, I can have three grams. Um, so in my cauliflower pizza here, I have 330 calories. So that would be roughly, so again, every 100 calories, three grams. So roughly about, you know, nine-ish grams of total fat is what I would like to see. But on my label, I see 15 grams. So yeah, a little bit higher than I would want to see. Now, does that mean I can never buy this and I can never eat this? No, I'm not saying that. But if you're buying a product that's going to be, again, part of your regular rotation, a bread, a cereal, whatnot, then you would want to try to stick to this as much as possible. Okay. Now, saturated fat, saturated fat, we want to aim for one gram or less per hundred calories. So good for me here. I got zero. Awesome. Now, I don't have this label with me, but I had this, I had a, a patient once in one of my classes and she was actually snacking on banana chips. And then we were, we were going through labels. And then when I got to this point, she's like, oh my gosh, and she raised her hand. And she's like, I have 13 grams of saturated fat, you know, on the label. And for saturated fat, just to kind of give you guys an idea, try to aim for about 15 grams, one five of saturated fat for the day. All right. So of the 50 to 60 total fat grams, about 15 or less can come from saturated fat. We do need some saturated fat in our body, again, for cholesterol production. We need some, not too much more, but some. So, um, so yeah, she had her banana chips and I was like, whoa, banana chips, you got saturated fat in there. And she gave me the label. I actually kept it, but again, I don't have it with, on me at the moment, but the ingredients for those banana chips were organic bananas, organic coconut oil, and I think is organic um, cane sugar. So her banana chips were actually deep fried in coconut oil, and coconut oil is a saturated fat. So therefore, half a cup, that was a serving size, half a cup of the banana chips, and I think she ate the whole pack as she was sitting there. So she definitely got more than half a cup it had almost a day's worth of saturated fat. So just to be aware of that, it sneaks in in very random places. Um, so yeah, we want one gram or less per 100 calories. So here in my cauliflower pizza, um, again, I got 330 calories. Um, so I should be aiming for three grams of saturated fat. I got five grams of saturated fat coming from cheese. So usually saturated fat is from animal products and those tropical oils. Now, trans fat, this luckily has been banned, allegedly. I'm saying allegedly because it's taking a long time for it to get transitioned out. Hopefully with our new administration, things will move along a lot quicker um, uh, with FDA uh, mandating these things and getting um, food manufacturers to, to follow through. But trans fat is a really bad fat. It's a Franken fat. It's a, it's, it's, it was a fat that was created to extend the shelf life of product. Because take a look at some of the baked goods that we have, right? You look at some of these baked goods. I was looking um, at some of the cookies that we have in our cupboard somehow. And the expiration date's like 2023. I'm like, wow, 
right? This cookie is going to last a long time, right? So previously, they were able to do this by basically taking polyunsaturated, like okay fats, like corn oil, uh, vegetable oil. And what they did is they hydrogenated it. They added hydrogen atoms to those liquid oils to solidify them and to make them more stable. And this was great. Back in the day when they did this, they did this like, I don't know, I think in the early 1900s. And it really sped up during, um, you know, after the world wars um, because they wanted to get products again to have long shelf lives, right? Because bread, if you make fresh bread, right? There's, that's why we have that saying day old bread. It goes bad after like a day or so. It gets more stale. But whereas breads that we buy in the store, right? They can last. Creamers, right? Creamers, usually you would have to refrigerate, but a lot of versions of creamers, we didn't have to. Margarine. I remember as a kid, margarine being very, very yellow. And this was what everyone was saying to use. That was hydrogenated um, corn oil, right? And this was what was recommended, but then things really turned very sour in terms of that they found that trans fat actually increased our bad cholesterol production, decreased good cholesterol production, increased total cholesterol, increased triglycerides, like everything bad. So basically increased risk of heart disease and stroke. So it was um, added to the food label, I think in 2006. And then, um, you know, different states started to, to ban it because this is what they used to fry French fries in, right? Over and over and over because it was, again, a stable oil. Um, but again, it, it's not a good oil. It still lurks out there. So I've seen it in like ready-made frostings. I've seen it in like, um, you know, cake mixes and things like that. So you basically read the ingredients section because whenever you read trans fat on a product, it is going to say zero. It's always going to say zero because this is the thing. There is a law that says that if there's 0.5 grams of saturated fat or 0.5 grams of trans fat in a serving, they can put zero. So for example, if you have chips, let's suppose the serving size of chips is like, I don't know, five chips, let's just say. And let's suppose those five chips have 0.5 grams of trans fat. They can round down to zero. But let's be honest, some people may not be just eating five chips, right? Especially if they got their guac, guacamole or salsa, right? Five will become 25. And then you got to multiply accordingly times, you know, 0.5 times five, you got 2.5 grams of trans fat that you didn't even realize you had in there. And there's no safe amount of trans fat, none. So that's why we would look on the ingredients panel. And if you see partially hydrogenated, just throw it away. Just throw it away. Fully hydrogenated is okay. But anything that's partially hydrogenated or hydrogenated, do not consume. So this brings up then the subject of margarines and, and butter and which is better and things like that. So let me just break it down. So if you are buying, if you're in the grocery store and you pick up some of these margarines, which by the way, they've now changed the name to vegetable oil blends, right? It sounds so neutral and so healthy, right? I'm having a vegetable oil blend. Um, so it's not margarine anymore sometimes in some of these um, products. So if you take a look at that, look at the ingredients, all right? If you see hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated, that is worse than butter. Put it away. But there are some versions of blends out there that are made with olive oil. They might be made with avocado oil, right? That would you know, just again, look at them. If they don't have partially hydrogenated, then that would be a little bit better than butter. But even then, everyone, these different spreads, you still need to be moderate in how much you're using, right? I would rather you use almond butter or peanut butter or even like smear some, you know, avocado instead of like butter and margarines. But if you want to have a little bit, then have a little bit, you know, and just, you know, just be cognizant of, of, of what you're, you're purchasing and how much you're having. So here are some common fat names. Remember, when I told you, read the ingredients, we want to try to avoid fat within those first three ingredients if that product has more than six ingredients. So if you see any type of fat. So obviously for us, of course, as Muslims, we're not even having lard. That's not even on our agenda <laughs> anyways. Um, 
butter, um, any type of oil. So coconut, avocado, et cetera. If it's the first ingredient in like a product, you want to try to avoid it. Now, obviously you guys, again, in like margarines or vegetable oil blends and things like that, you are going to see these fats in the beginning ingredients. That's a normal because that is a fat at the end of the day. So in that case, you want to look at the quality of the fat right? So for instance, if it's like corn oil versus, you know, avocado oil, the avocado oil is going to be better. It's a monounsaturated fat. So that's what we need to look at. And again, once again, I'm plugging my previous talk <laughs> that talks more about this. Shortening. Shortening is essentially partially hydrogenated oils, right? So for example, you know, um, vegetable shortening is usually just, you know, hydrogenated, partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. Margarine, hydrogenated oils, partially hydrogenated oils, mono and dry glycerides, we see this a lot. Interestified, we see this a lot. These are all, again, common fat names. Okay, moving along. Let's go to sodium. Now, sodium, my friends, again, this is a public health issue. We see like fat free products, we see low fat products, we see sugar free products, we see low sugar products. We don't see low sodium as much as we should be seeing. So this is really an issue, especially if we're buying packaged foods and processed foods, because sodium is a preservative. Think about the pioneers back in the day or, you know, early civilization that didn't have refrigerators, right? What do they do to, to preserve their meats, right? They would salt them, cure them, right? Um, so we already find sodium in foods. It is, again, it's in mineral we need sodium in our body. It's important for our heart contraction and so forth, right? It's an essential electrolyte. So all food is going to have some sodium anyways, right? We're never going to see zero. We don't never want to be zero sodium. The general population, we want to try to keep our sodium to roughly about 2,400 milligrams per day. This has gone up and down over the years, right? It went down to 1500 a couple years ago. And they're like, wow, that's really low. We can't do that. So 1500 is actually the recommendation for like heart patients. Um, you know, it's, it's very low in sodium. Um, then they did 20, they kind of, you know, played around with 2300 milligrams for, for a while. So between 2300 milligrams to 2400 milligrams is what we should be aiming for as, as a general population. And just to kind of give you guys a heads up of what this looks like. Now, remember, sodium is in salt. Salt is not sodium. Sodium is in salt, right? Salt is sodium chloride, right? With some iodine in there as well. So it's NaCl. So, you know, don't use those words, you know, synonymously because they're not the same. So sodium is in salt. So just to give you an idea, a teaspoon of salt has 2,000 milligrams of sodium. You're like more than, you're like almost there. So again, when we're cooking at home, that's not the problem. The problem is, again, we're buying processed and packaged foods and restaurant foods. It's crazy the amount of sodium that's lurking out there. So just to kind of make life easier, what we should try to do is try to aim for about 600 to 700 milligrams per meal. All right, per meal. And then the rest can be, you know, for your snacks. Now, let's suppose you pick up a product and you're like, I don't know, like, is this going to be my meal or is this going to be part of my meal? Whoops. So, um, for example, back to my cauliflower pizza. All right. So my cauliflower pizza has in half of the pizza, it's got 470 milligrams of sodium. So this is my whole meal. If I'm like, yeah, half the pizza is my meal then I'm good. But if I, but if I have the whole pie and I got to double this, so that's like what a thousand, sorry, I can't do math really fast, 950 milligrams. So that's quite a bit, right? But let's suppose this is part of my meal. What if I'm like, okay, I'm going to have my cauliflower pizza and then I'm going to have some garlic bread. I don't know. I'm going to have some salad and some dressing and then oh wow we're gonna have appetizers all right then so if all of a sudden things start to add up then what's helpful is to try to aim for 140 milligrams or less per serving so for example so again if you're at the grocery store and you're like i'm purchasing this bread i don't know how i'm gonna eat this bread is am i just gonna eat it by itself i'm gonna am i gonna make a sandwich am i gonna make it with eggs so in that case when you buy individual products 
try to aim for 140 milligrams or less per serving. But if that product is going to be your meal, then you can bump up to 600 to 700. So I don't know if that makes sense. I, I don't usually get feedback with this um, platform that we use, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to assume it made sense. Uh, but just kind of keep that in mind. Right, so if you're buying breads and things like that, try to have 140 milligrams or less. If you're buying like a you know like a, a TV dinner or something like that, then you would bump up because it would be a meal to about 600 or 700 milligrams. Now, a cup of noodle, right? A lot of these ramens that are really popular, ramen noodles that are really popular. Check out those labels. It's like easily a thousand milligrams at least, right? That was like freshman year of college, that, that was always our go-to, right? If we like ever missed lunch or dinner in the cafeteria, we're like, okay, I guess it's a cup of noodle type of day. So it's a lot of sodium in there, but usually that sodium is in the seasoning. So if you're like, I'm just using the noodles. Okay, fine. You know, it's going to be definitely less sodium. Um, but just, you know, even the, 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 the noodles themselves, just remember that's enriched flour. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. So some sources of sodium on the label, you'll see it. Uh, salt, sodium chloride, monosodium glutamate, saline, sodium benzoate, sodium bicarbonate, sodium nitrate. A lot of these are used as preservatives and additives. Um, but if you see it as like, again, the first three ingredients of a six ingredient product or more, just you might want to rethink that and then double check the, the label itself and look at the sodium amount. I'll give you an example. I wish I kept this label, but I had a... Um, a few years ago for Thanksgiving, I had bought this turkey brine. So it was like all these different seasonings, right? And usually these brines are mostly sodium. And um, so I remember looking at it and like the serving size was like one eighth of a teaspoon. I'm not even kidding. One eighth or something, one fourth, very small amount. And then it's like servings per container. It was something crazy, like 2,500 servings. <laughs> And the reason they did that was because the sodium was so much in that product. So I like, of course, you know, as a dietitian, I'm like, let me calculate this out. I was like, whoa, this whole thing, if I use this whole thing, it's going to be 20,000. I'm not kidding, guys. 20,000 milligrams of sodium going into that turkey. I was like, no way. I'm going to use less. And I'm going to use other stuff. Um, but it was really interesting because on the label, they purposely made the serving size so small so it didn't look as bad. But when you calculate all that stuff out, it can be scary sometimes. All right, moving on to fiber. Now, fiber, everyone, we just do not get enough. Um, here in the U.S., typical consumption of, of fiber per day is about 11 grams. And the recommendation for females is about 25 grams or more per day. This is for adult females. For males, about 38 grams or more per day. Um, so, you know, and there's different types of fiber. There's soluble fiber. There's insoluble fiber. So soluble fiber, this is actually, and both of them are good. This works more in helping us to reduce our cholesterol. It reduces cholesterol absorption. And it also helps us to um, reduce blood sugars. So that's how soluble fiber works. And soluble fiber we find in like oats and apples and beans and, and things like that. Then we have insoluble fiber. And insoluble fiber kind of is the fiber that kind of goes straight through because soluble fiber gets absorbed with water. So it becomes like this gel almost that's kind of like oozing through our body, but insoluble fiber kind of goes straight through and that helps us decrease risk of diverticulosis, decrease risk of, you know, certain cancers, keeps us regular. So it decreases risk of, of constipation. So we get that from like whole wheat and beans and grains and things like that, fruits and vegetables. So both fibers are good. And on the label, they'll just list dietary fiber. And so we only find fiber from plant-based foods. So you're not going to find fiber in meat. We're not going to find fiber in fat. Like oils are not going to have, um, you know, fiber. And that's the thing with this keto, keto diet um, is that we're not getting as much variety of fibers as we might normally get. And so that's why we actually are seeing a difference in the gut microbiome. And a lot of you know, I'm like a gut nerd, like major, like I'm obsessed with the gut. Um, and fiber really 
we want to have a variety of fiber, different types of fibers coming from everything, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, all of that, because these different fibers are fodder for, you know, the gut microbiome, for these different um, bacteria and viruses and yeast that proliferate in, in our GI tract, especially in our large intestine. So much research, I cannot even tell you how much research is coming out on the gut microbiome and how it not only affects just, you know, um, uh, digestion, but even our mood and brain health. Again, whole separate subject there. I gotta do an update on, the, on, on, the, on my gut session because a lot more hot information's come out. So we really wanna make sure we're getting in sufficient amounts of fiber and we wanna have a variety of fiber and it's always the best through its whole form, right? Like, yeah, you can buy like, you know, you know, Metamucil and Citrusel and some of these different fiber supplements and stir them into your, your, your water and just drink that. But there's something about food itself. We have to always remember that, everyone. So it's always better to get things through foods. And ideally, for good sources of fiber, ideally would be three grams or more per serving. But not everything is like that. Like, you know, I have some breads here. <laughs> with me and you know some breads are like one gram of fiber um this one i have here is is three grams of fiber um some grain products they they've been adding supplemental fiber functional fiber into there like and you'll see numbers like six grams seven grams um so they are adding you know different functional fibers in there inulin chicory root um uh, oligo fruct oligosaccharides uh fruit oligosaccharides so they're adding a lot of these things to foods to boost the fiber amount which is good and these are considered prebiotic food for our gut microbiome but just one side note is that remember our body does not have the digested enzymes to break down fiber so it remains relatively undigested then it hits our lower intestine all these microbes kick in and they try to like break it down and then they're fermenting it and as a result you know people get gas and bloating. I've had patients tell me, I think I'm allergic to fiber. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's just because your body's not used to all this fiber. If you've been living a relatively low fiber life and all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow, I'm going to have all this fiber stuff. Then our body's going to be like, what is going on here? So as a result, um, you know, our microbes, it takes some time for it to get used to this fiber increase. So when you're increasing your fiber, do it slowly have lots of water, get in physical activity, and just be patient because it takes time. You're not allergic to fiber, you'll be okay. But a lot of these functional fibers that they're adding into foods to kind of boost the fiber content, just be aware that you know you might get gas and bloating because of that as well. So just you know be patient in the process. Now whole grains, whole grains are a really good source um, of, of, of fiber. And um, I'm really big on people getting some sort of a grain. Like I'm not really big on like grainless existence unless, you know, your doctor's recommending it for whatever reason. Um, if you want to stay away from wheat, that's fine. Um, but at least try to get the ancient grains in like barley, you know, bulgur, things like that. You know, I always consider these are considered, you know, uh, these are sunna foods. Prophet some he ate you know, barley and, and a different grain. So just for that reason, at least get some into your, into your body. Um, so when we're picking grains, we ideally want to have whole grains. All right. So whole grain. So on the left-hand side, this is what a whole grain looks like. It has three layers. So the outer layer is like this bran layer. So it's like a fiber filled layer. It's got B vitamins and minerals. Then the inner layer is like the germ. It's, this is where like, the seed basically can sprout from. This is a nutrient packed core. It's got B vitamins, which are very key for, for energy metabolism, a vitamin E, a very important um, antioxidant, phytochemicals, healthy fats. So that's in the germ. And usually what manufacturers do is they actually remove the bran and the germ. So that's why we see oat bran. That's why we see wheat germ um, sold separately because they remove them a lot of times because, because of the fats and things like that, it can cause the grain to spoil a little bit quicker. So a lot of times manufacturers remove those and then we're just left with the endosperm, which is just this starchy carbohydrate middle layer. It's got some proteins and vitamins, but not what we lost in the brand and the germ. And then what they do is they grind this up and then 
this becomes wheat flour. Wheat. So just because it's whole, sorry, just because it's wheat does not mean it's a whole grain. So if you're like, yeah, I'm doing good. I've got wheat sub, wheat uh, sub sandwich. Yeah, you're doing okay. <laughs> but it would have been better if you got whole wheat or whole grain or even sprouted a grain in instead. So then they take the wheat flour, they, they process it more, um, it becomes white flour. They can bleach it or unbleach it, and then they enrich it. It is the law here. They have to enrich the grain. Um, and so manufacturers, they enrich it. They add some folic acid. They'll add some of the B vitamins, you know, um, what else? Uh, iron, things like that, that they have to, but we can never replicate what we lost in nature. So that's why it's always best to try to get, you know, the whole grain itself. So the same thing with like brown rice and some of these ancient grains, they are the whole intact grains. That's why brown rice takes so long to cook because it's got three layers to, to cook versus just the white rice is just, you know, it is basically refined, it's just one layer. So ideally we wanna get whole grains, whole wheat, you wanna see the term whole. So these are the type of whole grains that you will see out in the marketplace. And a lot of these are ancient grains as well. Um, so amaranth, barley, buckwheat, corn, which includes the whole cornmeal and popcorn, okay, not kettle, chocolate, you know, butter, popcorn, just like plain natural popcorn. Millet, oats, including oatmeal, but not instant oats. Instant oats is, is processed. They pulverize that down to make it a smaller uh, granule so it cooks faster. Quinoa, rice, both brown rice and colored rices, rye, sorghum, which is also called milo, teff, triticale, and then wheat. And wheat itself has different varieties like spelt, emmer, farro, einkorn, kamut, durum, etc a bulgur, cracked wheat, wheat berries. So for those that are, you know, gluten-free, have celiacs, whatnot, then you need to keep in note that these are also actually considered wheat and do have gluten. Um, and then wild rice also. So when you're in the store, this is what you would look for. You would look for whole grain and then the name of the grain, whole wheat, whole, whatever the other grain's name is, stone ground, whole, brown rice, oats, oatmeal, wheat berries. So these contain all parts of the grain. So you're getting all the nutrients of the whole grain itself. And also sprouted, that should be here, sprouted grain, apologies, sprouted as well. Now these are maybes. So they might be whole grains, might not, it really depends. Um, so when in doubt, don't trust these words. So like wheat, wheat flour, semolina, durum, organic flour, stone ground, hit or miss, multigrain. This is always um, very interesting. Multigrain means these are multiple grains. They may not all be whole grains. So just because it's multigrain doesn't necessarily mean it's necessarily better. I, I was at the store the other day and I saw um, multigrain, um, kind of like Cheerios, they're like a store variety of, of the O's. And it said multi-grain, healthy, this and that, and cholesterol-free and all this good stuff. And then when I look at it, I was like, it was like white flour. And there was like whole wheat flour as well. And there's like sugar and like corn. And yeah, it's multiple grains, but they weren't all necessarily good grains. Now these are not whole grains. So enriched flour is not a whole grain. So this is a, a, a this should be a, ideally a nice New Year's resolution. Um, it's just maybe you don't want it. You want to stop eating as much enriched products, enriched flours, um, degerminated. You'll see this on cornmeal and bran and germ. So bran and germ are components of the grain. Remember, they have their nutrients, but they're not a whole grain because they're just a component. All right, moving on to sugar. All right, my friends. So let's take a look at your labels again. So in the previous label, it would just say total sugar or just sugar. And that would mean natural sugars and it would mean added. So in the previous labels, if you have the old label, when you see sugar, ideally try to keep to less than 10 grams per serving. Sorry, 10 grams per meal and less than five grams per uh, serving. So sugar has, you know, it's, five letters that make up the word sugar. So that's what we should try to aim for, less than five grams per serving. This is for the old label, when they just lumped them all together. 
the new label differentiates added sugars. So ideally, we want to see zero. All right, zero is what we want to see. The American Heart Association recommends for added sugars, ladies, uh, less than 25 grams per day, which is about six and a half teaspoons. Gentlemen, less than 37.5 grams per day. That's about nine and a half teaspoons. This is added sugar. So this is not the sugar that's in my fruit. This is not the sugar in my plain yogurt. This is not the sugar in my plain milk. This is not that. This is added. So if I'm having chocolate milk, right? If I'm having, I don't know, a caramel mocha macchiato, right? All that syrup that goes into there, right? This is my dessert. This is my, you know, um, what else? You know, my adding my Nutella to my, my toast, right? All those are, are added sugar. So all of those combined together, we should try to keep to this quantity. Now, how can we calculate out teaspoon? So this is what you do. So when you see grams of sugar, all right, so you see grams of sugar, divide that number by four. All right, so let's suppose, uh, let's pretend this was 20 grams. I know it's just two here, but pretend it's at 20 grams. You would divide that by four, that would tell you how many teaspoons you're consuming. That is really eye-opening. So let me just, I'll come back to this. Let me show you. So here is a, this is a real yogurt that I just ate the other day. <laughs> but anyways, um, so it was in our fridge and I'm like, you know, it's, it's almost expiring. I better eat it. But anyways, if you take a look, right? So the serving size was the whole container here. It, it looks bigger than it is, six, six ounce. Um, actually, I have it here. So I'll show you guys. So just a little regular yogurt here about, yeah, five and a half, five and a half ounce. Um, zero percent milk fat. Um, anyways, so if, uh, serving size is the whole container. So take a look at this. The sugars here are 14 grams. All right. And of this, of this 14 grams, 11 is added sugars. All right. So meaning three grams are the natural sugar that's just coming from the lactose. So even plain yogurt, plain yogurt will even have sugar just itself. It will say sugar on there. And then people freak out, oh my gosh, there's sugar in my milk, there's sugar in my yogurt. Yeah, that's lactose. That's fine. It's these added sugars we're, we're concerned about. So take a look. So it's got 11 grams. So 11 grams, they added in separately. So then divide this by four. So that's like what? Um, Oh my gosh, you guys, I can't do math all of a sudden. I'm like blanking out. Oh my gosh, two and a half, almost two and a half uh, teaspoons of, of sugar here. So think about that. So when I read that, I was like, oh, and I read this after I ate it. Um, so I was like, oh my gosh, there's two and a half teaspoons of sugar. They basically spooned in here and, and put it in here. That's a lot, right? So it's better, honestly, for yogurts because our yogurt aisles, are crazy here in the US, right? It's like overwhelming. There's just so many varieties. So my recommendation is just get like plain yogurt. This actually, what I had purchased was, was vanilla yogurt, um, which is fine. I'm okay with vanilla. I'm okay with, you know, uh, the flavored ones like that. But anything extra, like creme brulee yogurt, um, you know, key lime pie yogurt, it's a lot of sugar. So it's better sometimes just get like the regular yogurt and then you can doctor it up, right? Add your honey, add your, your, your fruit, because then you can control what you're doing. Even if you want to add in sugar, go ahead. It's probably going to be less than two and a half teaspoons that they added in here. So very eye-opening when you start to convert the added sugars into teaspoons. And I recommend, this is a really good activity to do with kids, Right. If your kids are like, oh, I really want to have this cookie or I want to have this, you know, dessert or juice or whatever, you know, sodas, hopefully not. Hopefully kids are not having soda. But when you look at the amount of sugar and you put it into teaspoon form, it's very eye opening. Right. If you have like sugary cereals at home and your kid like insists on having be like, let's let's look at how much sugar actually is in this. Because there's no benefit to sugar, my friends, like nothing, nothing. Now, another thing we see a lot of is artificial sweeteners. This is being added a lot in like light foods, sugar-free foods. You'll see a lot of these artificial sweeteners. And um, the thing with artificial sweeteners is they're not absorbed by the body. So they, that's why there's zero calories. So this kind of goes straight through. And there's you know some research that's indicating that these sweetener, sweeteners might actually negatively affect our gut microbiome. 
we're seeing that some of these sweeteners might actually increase insulin levels. So it might even work in a different level um, for those that have diabetes and, and, and prediabetes. And actually for everyone, insulin and blood sugars are an issue because if we have rapid rises and dips of blood sugars, this can actually be inflammatory for the body. So long-term, this is not good for anybody, um, you know, the, the rapid rises and, and falls of, 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 of blood sugars. So that's what we're seeing with some of these artificial sweeteners is, again, they might actually be affecting the gut microbiome and, you know, negatively. And these artificial sweeteners, everyone, they are like 250 to 10,000 times sweeter than sugar. I think Neotame here, I think Neotame is like 10,000, 8,000, I don't know, some crazy amount sweeter than sugar. So imagine how this is affecting our taste buds. Every day you're putting in your neo neotame, actually you can't buy like, you know, as a packet, I think it's, it's just in, used in industrial format. Um, but for example, you know, Stevia, Splenda um, are like 250 times sweeter than sugar. So imagine how this affects people's taste buds. I had a patient once and um, really out of control diabetes, and um, so I was talking to her and I'm like, hey, well, what do you eat? Like, what's going on? Um, so she was telling me, yeah, she's like, I had, I had fruit. That was my dessert, you know, and I added sugar. And I was like, why are you adding sugar? And she's like, well, it just didn't taste sweet to me. I'm like, you had strawberries. It's like peak strawberry season. I, of course, this was in my mind. I wasn't saying it to her in person, but in my mind, I was like, whoa, you're adding sugar to strawberries? And it turned out she actually was doing a lot of, of artificial sweetener. Because she was, she's like, oh, I, I thought that's good for me as a diabetic. So she was adding like lots of it to her coffee and, and stuff. And it really affected her taste buds negatively. So I do not recommend artificial sweeteners to anybody except diabetics. But even diabetics, I recommend small amounts, like be moderate, maybe like, you know, max a couple of, of packets. And then, you know, even like the diet sodas and things like that, those how I a diet soda has, has um, acylfame potassium usually added in there. And there's a lot of question marks about acylfame potassium, aspartame. I know aspartame for me personally, if I ever have aspartame, gives me a bad headache. Um, so sucralose even commonly known as Splenda, there's a lot of question marks about potential disease risk, cancer risk later on. I mean, again, a lot of research looking at this. So again, those I would not recommend. So right now, maybe stevia is, is, is neutral right now because stevia, yes, stevia comes from a plant. But just remember everyone, because people, I hear this from people, oh, stevia is coming from a plant, it's healthy. I'm like, look, how would you eat stevia in, in real life like for people like populations that had stevia? They would take the plant and put the, and eat the leaf. They would not be processing the leaf, making it very concentrated, and then cutting it with sugar alcohols, which is what some of these stevia sweeteners are doing. So yeah, it's coming from a natural source, but it's very concentrated that we would not have been normally consuming. So again, so right now stevia is neutral, it's fine, whatever, um, but just be moderate. And then sugar alcohols, these are components of sugar, they're not well absorbed. So they actually have a laxative effect in the body because they're not well absorbed. So they're not really digested, broken down. They hit our lower intestine and then our, our gut bacteria have a party. And so you might actually have like a, a laxative effect. Um, so they even put that on the label. They even will list it. Um, it may have a laxative effect. So some examples of sugar, alcohol, sorbitol, mannitol, xylitol. Uh, so you'll see OL at the end. Um, a very a very popular sugar alcohol right now that actually is pretty neutral. It's actually pretty decent. It's erythritol. So that's being added to a lot of things. It's pretty neutral right now. We don't see this, this effect. Um, and again, it has more of a slower absorption. It is still sugar, a component of sugar, but it's, but it's more slowly absorbed. And we'll usually find this in like chewing gum, sugar-free foods and things like that. So just be aware. Um, and I, actually, let me go back. I forgot. These are some common terms for sugar. And this is the most common question I have people ask me all the time. What's a good sugar? I'm like, nothing. There's no good sugar. There's no good sugar. Sugar is sugar. Sweetener is sweetener, my friends. It's going to have basically the same type of effect in our body. Those that are a little bit more higher in fructose value, for example, like agave, fructose is, is metabolized a little bit different in, in, in our body. It, it hits our liver in a little bit of a different way. So you know, I wouldn't really um, recommend agave um, for that reason. Um, but all sweeteners are sweeteners. And there is over, this is like a handful. There are 70 
different types of sugars that manufacturers use that are added into our products. 70, and I'm sure that list is growing day by day. So many different types. So anything with O-S-E at the end, sucrose, dextrose, maltose, lactose, that is sugar. Honey. Now, I'm always partial to honey because, of course, it's a sin of food. And honey actually is a prebiotic. So it's actually good fodder for our gut microbiome. Antioxidants in there. So, you know, I, I do recommend honey as, as a sweetener, but even then use it moderately and try to get local organic honey. There's some research looking at whether it could help with allergies because you have exposure to the pollen. So, you know, very interesting to, 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 to see. Um, you know, evaporated cane juice, we see this a lot in foods. Uh, cane juice, we see this a lot in foods. Brown sugar, I love this. I have people text me all the time. Um, so is brown sugar better than me? For me, it's brown and fiber is brown. I'm like, no, my friend, brown sugar is brown because of molasses. Um, so it's not fiber that it's making it, it's making it brown. Um, so again, there's no good sugar. You know, yeah, we see some, you know, some neutral things about monk fruit sugar, coconut sugar, date sugar, you know, but just whatever you're having, pick the one that you're able to use less of. All right. So if you're like, look, I put a little bit of brown sugar in my tea and I feel good. But if I use white sugar, then I put two teaspoons. Then okay, then use brown sugar. Use the one you use less of, and try to train your palate to use less. Uh, we just finished a, a sugar challenge I did with some of my buddies, and uh, I think it's a lot easier this time around. And basically, our sugar challenge was 14 days no added sugar. And my rule was, if it tastes sweet, don't eat it, minus fruit. And again, it really retrains your palate. And when I was on the sugar challenge, I accidentally, yeah, it was an accident. I accidentally had um, one of those hot cocoa bombs. And I don't know, I hadn't had a, a momentary lapse um, of memory. And um, I had that. And oh my gosh, I just, it really affected me so negatively. I had such a horrible headache. It made me really feel sick to my stomach because I just wasn't having so much sugar. So that's the thing. We can train our palates. Now, also, we see additives and preservatives added to food. And again, there's reasoning. There's, and there's research looking at a lot of these additives, additives and preservatives. Um, you know, what are long-term effects? So that's why we ideally want to, you know, just be moderate in our processed foods. But preservatives will keep food from spoiling, help maintain freshness and color or flavor of foods. They're often added to baked goods, meats, jellies, and beverages. And here's some common preservatives that we see. So ascorbic acid, a citric acid, um, you know, uh, sodium benzoate, calcium propionate, you know, vitamin E, BHA, BHT, we see this a lot. They're usually used in breakfast cereals to prevent change in color, odor, or flavor. So again, these are all neutral. These are fine, right, as of now. But of course, we don't want to go overboard with anything. So, you know, ideally, you know, less processed foods, the better. Additives, according to the FDA, this is any substance added to food, including preservatives, food coloring, flavor enhancers, thickeners, stabilizers, nutrients, and sweeteners. So some examples, you know, these dyes and the... Uh, uh, leavening agents like baking soda, calcium carbonate. A lot of research is looking at this, you know, carrageenan, xanthane gum, you know, for their long-term effects. So again, be moderate. Dyes, we want to kind of, you know, really try to decrease the amount. And they're looking, there's a lot of research, again, looking at dyes and, and, and children's mental health and so forth. I'm going to actually skip food date um, terms. Actually, no, let me do it real quick. So I might go a little bit over, guys. Sorry. Um, just I have two more slides left. So expiration dates. I'm a big one on expiration dates. <laughs> um, I find many things in my cabinet. I'm like, whoa, it's expired in 2017. And I forgot about this. Should I eat it or not? So this is the thing, you guys. And, and a lot of times people do this. They're like, oh, let me taste it. Let me smell it. Let me see if it's okay. A lot of times there's microbes, you guys, that we can't see or taste that can make us sick. So don't taste it or smell it and think it's okay because it might have proliferation of a microbe in there um, that can, you know, then cause issues. So I, I am really um, also a, a big geek on food safety. Microbiology changed my life when I took it in college. Um, so that's, again, a separate session we can talk about. Um, but yeah, expiration date, you know, it, it just, their safety dates, they're usually found on fresh foods or even dried goods. You know, if, so if it's like something perishable and it's beyond the expiration date, I would toss it, especially right now with, you know, COVID and, and everything, you know, going on. Um, and, you know, if you use food past the date, you know, there is a risk for foodborne illness. So again, it, there is a risk. 
Um, you know, like dairy, you can do a couple of days, you know, here and there. Um, best if used by, this indicates when a food's quality or freshness may start to deteriorate. So it might not taste as good as it did earlier, but it's not necessarily going to be unsafe. Um, and sell by, this is usually for manufacturers. Um, they guys sell it by a certain date. So if you, you know, are at the store and you see something that the sell by date has passed, I wouldn't buy it. You know, it's not recommended to purchase that. But if it's at home and it's past that, it, sh it should be okay. And just, you know, sometimes just err on the, on, on the, side of caution and just you know toss things out sometimes okay and last but not least now this is a whole separate talk i'm just gonna like you know touch the just dance on the subject right here i'm not gonna go in depth on it because again it's it's a whole beast in and of itself and this is a supplement industry so one thing i have to really emphasize is the supplement industry so this is like vitamins and minerals and like herbal supplements and like you know things like that which can not only come in pill form, but also powder form and liquid form. Just remember everyone, it's the wild, wild west out there here in the US with those supplements because they're not as tightly regulated by the FDA as medications. They're not. It's actually up to the manufacturer to do these tests to test their safety and then put them out there. And then if, you know, if someone got sick or things like that, then it's up to the manufacturer to pull them off the shelf. I mean, FDA will come in and, 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 and of course, you know, mandate that and so forth. But it's really actually up to the, the manufacturer. And a lot of times we have found products that don't necessarily include what they say. And they can be tainted with other things as well. I know a while ago, they actually had um, found in like a very... Uh, common protein supplements. They actually found traces of arsenic um, in some of those su supplements. They had to take them off the shelf. Um, so every so often, random stuff happens. So just keep that in mind. So when you're buying supplements, you want to try to see the USP symbol or the NSF symbol. Um, these you know, are basically verified. Their quality has been verified by an outside group, consumer group, that whatever they say is in the product is in the product. And even what they can write on the, the products, you know, they have to be very careful. Like, you know, it, they can't say that this product is going to cure you, you know, from COVID, right? They can't say stuff like that. They might say things like, you know, might help immune system. It might support, you know, the system. So just, you know, be careful. And some of these supplements, you know, run it by your doctor before having it. Because some of these supplements could have contraindications to medications or even conditions. So for example, like turmeric. Right? A lot of people like to do turmeric supplements. Just be careful, especially those that have gallbladder disease um, or kidney issues. It might exacerbate the situation. So you have to really be careful about some of these things. Omega-3s, like fish oil, for instance, are not recommended for those that are on blood thinners or those that have uh, are taking um, hypertension medications because they're thinning the blood out. So always run it by your doctor. Um, only take supplements if you're deficient in that. Right. Because, you know, if you're like, oh, yeah, I'm not feeling good. I think I'm low in iron. Let me get some iron supplements. All these supplements, all these vitamins and minerals have upper limits. And upper limits can actually be toxic. So, for example, iron. Iron has upper limit. Too much iron can actually be toxic. Right. It can affect the brain. So we really got to be careful how much we're, we're taking. So when you're reading the vitamin and mineral supplements, if you see like 10,000% of what you need daily value, be care, I wouldn't do it. It's always better to get things through the foods. They did a study on smokers, you know, um, some time back where they gave smokers mega doses of some of the antioxidants, vitamin A and C, I think E as well. And they actually had to stop the study because it actually backfired. Because there's something about food we can't replicate in the supplements. So that's why with supplements, just be careful, especially right now with COVID, you see a lot of things like take this supplement, do this supplement, you know, it's gonna help you, it's gonna cure you. I mean, just be careful, you know, so talk to a dietitian, I'd be more than happy to help you talk to a doctor about contraindicated indications, talk to pharmacists, you know, definitely um, before adding any random stuff, um, you know, to, to, to um, our, our diets. All right, guys, we did it. We made it <laughs> at the end of our session here. And let me take a look at some of the questions in the chat box. So let's see. OK, so yes, we will have the recording online for a limited time. So if you're not on our 
a mailing list, I highly recommend getting on our mailing list. We don't, we won't inundate you with too many messages. Um, and then I think if you just do a search on YouTube, I pop up. Um, so let's see. <laughs> okay. I eat a lot of home baked beets. How much is too much? So I'm kind of curious to know how much a lot is. Because this is the thing, you know, the best thing is honestly just try to have a balance, right, of everything. Because remember, there's so many nutrients, antioxidants and, and phytochemicals and vitamins and, and mineral and all of these different nutrients that we want to have a variety. So, you know, for our vegetables, we should try to keep our vegetables to about half of our plate. These are the non-starchy vegetables, which are all the vegetables except peas, corn, potatoes. So for beets, you know, have a variety. Don't just like just be focusing on beets, right? Add in other things as well. So I would just recommend maybe like, I don't know, if you want like an amount per day, maybe like a couple of cups max. Uh, the thing with vegetables um, is that it's hard to eat a lot. Like I've never seen anyone overdose on vegetables because there's so much fiber in there and they're so filling. It's hard to get a lot, a lot. But you know, just for the sake of balance and moderation and variety, you know, I would recommend, you know, mixing it up. All right. So how many servings of beets should we eat per day considering it has sugar? So this is natural sugar. So remember that it has got natural sugar. It's got fiber. So it works differently in our body. So, um, you know, for, again, like I said, you know, a couple of cups max, I'm saying max, max. Um, I would try to, you know, get the variety in, um, I'm just trying to, you know, think. I don't know if if if, if the sister is still online. I'm kind of curious how much you're exactly having per day, um, so I I kind of respond accordingly. I want to know what you're what you're doing and what else you're eating. Because remember, also it depends on what else was going on. All right. Should you let us know about diabetic and uric acid gout diet? Yeah, I'm not going to go into separate diets um, in this session. Um, you know, they're they're really nuanced. Um, so I'm gonna. I can answer that question. Maybe you can e email us, email um, our Rahma Foundation, and I can answer those personally um, once I get more information um, on your end. Are liquid aminos good? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, you can use it instead of soy sauce. Yeah, for sure. If we buy milk products that are not organic, but clearly state no growth hormones. Yeah, that's fine. Um, but just remember that, you know, they might be injected with, you know, antibiotics and then what they're feeding the animals you know, um, that's also um, another issue. But, you know, if, if you're not drinking that much milk, you're not having milk products that often, you know, and, and they're not organic, again, that, that should be okay overall. All right. If the GMO claim is greater yield, wouldn't that mean that the nutrients absorbed from the soil is split between a greater yield? Wow, that's very fascinating, deep question. Um, so, huh. I think it's the way that the, the 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 plant is grown, right? And whether it can withstand like pesticides, sorry, it can withstand pests and, um, you know, nature's other effects. Um, so I'm not really familiar with like the farming practices in terms, because I know farmers have to rotate their crops, right? So that the mineral value, um, you know, basically, we, we see um, a variety there. We don't want to deplete the soil. So I'm not really sure too much on, on that level. So apologies. In reference to banana and avocado, what about pesticides in soil that might be taken up by plant roots and moved to other plant tissues, including the fruit? So it's organic. But yeah, that's, that's a really, again, that's a really good question. That's a really deep question. Um, so remember, you know, yes, they're spraying things and yeah, it does get into the soil. It can get seeped in, but it's gonna be a lot less exposure than when they're directly spraying them and, and absorbing. So overall, if you're able to get everything organic, organic then, then go for it, you know? Um, so that would be fine. Um, I was wondering, okay, yes, thank you for bringing that up, Sadia K. Okay. Um, you're wondering if, if we peel the skin off non-organic fruits, does that minimize the pesticides in terms of daisy stores? How do we know where the produce, okra, et cetera, comes from? Yeah, that's a good question in terms of, and ask them, where are you getting this from? Um, you know, it could be locally grown. It could be from other different parts of the country. It might even be international. So yes, great question. And I forgot to actually talk about that. So 
for these organic foods, if you're like, yeah, I can't get everything organic, it's pricey, or I don't know if I even want to or whatnot. So what you can do is you can always soak the fruits and vegetables in a solution of a vinegar and water. So like, I think a very little bit of vinegar, you know, and water and just let them kind of soak. That kind of helps. You can even do a salt, salt solution. That could help a little bit. Um, you don't need these vegetable oil, sorry, these vegetable sprays and washes. You don't necessarily need them. We, we haven't seen you know, that, that many benefits or help from that. But just washing them really well. Yeah, if you want to peel some of the skin off, you can. There are a lot of nutrients in there as well. Um, but yeah, that, that would be fine. But yeah, you can do like like a like a vinegar soak to, to help remove some of the, the pesticides. Is it necessary to get organic vegetables if we are fully cooking the vegetables? Oh, that's a great question too. Um, I get the need for organic food if we're cook, eating them directly. Yes. Now, the organic vegetables, yeah, you're right. You know, if you're cooking them, yeah, you might uh, you know, see, you know, decrease in, in some of those pesticides that have seeped in there or maybe they come, might come out in the water. Again, a lot of, we still need to look into that. Um, but if you're getting the vegetables and you're eating them in a salad, then yeah, you would have more direct exposure. But cooking decreases a little bit. But again, remember, they're grown in that. They seep in. So just keep that in mind. What oil do you recommend for cooking? Yeah, so I, um, we talked about this in the first session, the Nutrition 101. So I recommend like um, olive oil or avocado oil. Olive oil, ideally the extra virgin olive oil, but that burns pretty quick. So, you know, you wouldn't want to cook it at high temperatures for a long period of time. Um, so yeah, like cooking olive oil or the avocado oil would be my two preferences. Canola is okay. I kind of hesitate when I, as I say that. Um, I like gut wise don't have too much fondness of it. Um, it's okay. We, in, in the research, it's so far been okay. Um, but, you know, then we see other things about it being processed, but all oil, to be honest, if you think about it, it's processed. All oil is processed. We don't naturally find oil in nature, you know, cooking oil. So we just keep that in mind. How do we know the food label for fruits? Do we go? Oh, that's a great question. So yeah, all the vitamins and minerals and nutrients. Yeah, you can Google that and to see the, the nutrient amount um, and, you know, the, the, you know, the sodium and things, but those are things like I wouldn't worry about sodium and things coming from fruit. For sugar, remember it's natural fructose, right? And so then you want to just stick to the serving size amount. So I had recommended about three servings, uh, three or four, three to five servings per day. So if you go to my previous session, I actually talk about serving sizes for fruit in there, actually all the different um, food groups, I talk about uh, serving sizes. So serving size for fruit would be like half a cup cut up fruit, um, like a small banana, apple or oranges about the size of like a tennis ball would be considered one serving. Um, and one serving of fruit for those that are diabetic um, is you know 15 grams of carbs, which is one serving of carb. Um, why do they put gelatin in the fiber supplements? I don't recommend any brand of fiber. Because I prefer we get fiber through fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, and lentils. Like if you're having issues with, you know, constipation, your child and this and that, then you can do some of these fiber supplements. Um, look for like soluble fiber, um, ideally, um, or a mixture of soluble and insoluble fiber. Um, I'm not sure why they put gelatin in there. It doesn't really make sense. Um, so maybe it's just look for different brands. The brands that I've seen... Um, usually don't have gelatin in there. All right, uh, what do you think of red or brown raw rice? Is that a good grain instead of what? Yes, that would definitely be a good grain. Although I don't know if you wanna eat it raw, but yes, cooking brown rice, uh, red rice, black rice, wild rice, those are actually considered ancient grains. They haven't changed um, those through the years. How do you know if you're getting enough fiber? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I would honestly, the best way is look at your digestion. Like, are you using the restroom, you know, regularly? You're having regular bowel movements. Um, that's a really good indicator. And then, um, you know, you can go online and check this out. Um, but you can even look at, you can even evaluate how your stool looks, right? There's a whole, you know, science behind that. Um, you know, if you have like, you know, stool very hard, like pellets, then right, you need to bump up the fiber. Um, so yeah, you can actually look online. They'll even show you pictures of what your stool should look like. And that's, that's a good indicator of whether you're getting enough fiber. 
Um, honestly, if you do half your plate as vegetables for every meal, and you should be doing really good on the fiber front. What is your opinion? Oh, I love this on collagen peptides. I love it. Um, I love the question. So the jury is out on collagen. So some studies show some benefits, other studies are neutral. So we haven't really seen in, in the literature anything to really um, you know, suggest that everyone should be taking collagen. So collagen, again, very important for you know, tissue, bones, muscles. Um, but one thing I wanna know, point out is the precursor to, to collagen that helps with collagen protection is vitamin C. So we got to make sure we're getting good amounts of vitamin C um, in, in, in our body. And again, ideally through, through foods. Um, and so anyways, I was really curious about the, the collagen supplements. So I know a few years ago, I actually took collagen supplements. I noticed absolutely nothing. Um, and then um, recently, I, I've, we found this nice, you know, halal legit um, collagen powder. And so I was taking it. I was like, my mom take it. So I was actually asking my mom the other day. I'm like, did you notice anything? She's like, no. She's like, I was hoping my hair wouldn't fall as much. And um, and I asked, she has arthritis. I'm like, did you notice anything in your joints? And she didn't notice anything. I didn't notice anything. So I don't know. I, I feel like, I don't know. We just don't know. You can try it and see how you feel. Um, but we haven't seen, you know, anything outstanding um, in, in, in the literature. And then, honestly, if you're having like, you know, bone broth, if you're having, you know, chicken broth, things like that, you'll get collagen there as well. And when you're eating meats and things like that. Okay, I heard only water-soluble vitamin could be, should be consumed. Great question. So water-soluble vitamins are all the B vitamins and vitamin C and choline. So these are the water-soluble vitamins, meaning that our body doesn't, like, like whatever excess we consume, our body removes. All right, and then we have the fat-soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D, E and K. And those need a little bit of fat to be absorbed. And they also get stored in fat, meaning we can go overboard. So vitamin A, D, and a K, we want to, you know, I wouldn't take, you know, I'd be careful about the supplements, how much we're taking and so on and so forth. Um, but we should be consuming both water soluble and fat soluble. We need both of them. Because like I said, vitamin A, D, D, I was, I, mean, I could have a whole session just on vitamin D's benefits. Um, vitamin E and K. K is very important for clotting. So we need those vitamins as well. So they should be consumed, but all of these should be consumed ideally in, in their food form. Are there processed foods that is not as bad for you? What about vitamin expiration dates? So great. So no, no. So, so processed foods, there's different definitions of processed foods. Because like I said, you know, um, like oatmeal. If you're buying oatmeal, it kind of is processed, right? Like it's not just raw oats coming from the field straight into our box, right? They process it a little bit, right? They clean it up. But, and then, then there's ultra processed where there's like, you know, a lot of ingredients, this whole huge process they've gone through. So just ask yourself how many steps from farm to fork, like how many steps did this have to go through for this to get where it is? Um so again, not all processed food is bad for you because again, it depends on the level of processing, but those ultra processed foods, like, I don't know, like the processed meats, like, you know, hot dogs and, you know, you know, the beef sausages and all those things, like that's way, 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 way processed. Um, but not all are bad. And yeah, vitamins do have expiration dates. So just be aware of those. You know, usually this is a pretty long expiration date. You should be fine with that. Um, so yeah, so uh, you so you're mentioning how many beats you have. One or two beats per oh yeah, that's fine. One or two beats per day is totally fine. Yeah, you're good, you're good. And then someone asked the question, yeah, what is your opinion on collagen peptides? And I just answered that. All right. So any other questions, comments? I am now looking at the chat, so I can answer. So hopefully this was helpful, everyone. Um, there's a lot. Again, I can go on so many tangents. We can have a whole day long <laughs> session on just nutrition itself. Um, one more question popped up. My bones are a little weaker than previous years. Do you recommend calcium or day? Okay, great question. So yes, um, usually we, depending on the age, we recommend about 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams of calcium uh, for women. Um, so this is the thing. Is we also don't want to go overboard with calcium either. Um, so your calcium supplements, including the calcium that you're consuming. So dairy is a good source of calcium and you don't have to have cow's products to have you know, 
calcium because in like almond milk, soy milk, all these different milks, they are adding calcium anyway. So you're, you're good to go on that. Um, so all your calcium combined, you want to try to stick to about 1200 milligrams. I wouldn't go beyond that, to be honest. Um, and then for calcium supplements themselves, you want to space them out. Because we can, our body can only absorb, you know, a, you know, a certain amount of calcium at a time, like maybe about 500, 600 milligrams, give or take at one time. So you want to space the calcium supplements out and you do not want to take calcium with iron. Calcium and iron compete and uh, actually calcium wins, um, but then iron loses out. So you want to kind of space things out. So yeah, you can have calcium supplements. That's fine. If you have a multivitamin, usually I'm actually okay with people having multivitamins, you know, like a few times a week to kind of cover basis. Like I'm cool with that. And there are certain supplements that, you know, I, I do recommend. Like I think for women, as one gets older, especially if, you know, osteoporosis, um, you know, runs in the family or you, know, you just never really had a lot of dairy when you were younger um, or calcium when you were younger, then, you know, a little bit of calcium supplements will be okay. Um, and I, I also really recommend vitamin D. Vitamin D helps calcium get absorbed. Um, and, you know, for vitamin D, about a thousand international units IU, you know, spaced out during the week would, would, would be good, would be fine. Um, so yeah, to have calcium, but just make sure you don't go overboard. So 1200 milligrams um, with, with supplements and um, food. Yeah, old fashioned oats is fine. So you wanna get the, the oats that take time to cook. They're not like the 30 second, let me just microwave it and, 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 and leave um, oats. So old fashioned, slow cooked, um, you know, steel cut oats, all of those are okay. Yeah. All right, so I think we're good. Thank you everyone for attending. Fadwa, if you want to give a little plug for Rahma, that would be awesome. But thank you everyone for your time and, and, and giving me a portion of your Sunday morning here. So hopefully these, um, this was helpful. And you can always, you know, email uh, us at the Rahma Foundation and then they'll send those um, emails to me and I can answer any questions that you may have. Um, but thank you again, everyone, for your, for your time and attention. Thank you, Ruhi, for a great presentation and clarifying uh, how to meet our nutritional needs um, using food labels and understanding food labels better. So we really appreciate that. We appreciate everybody who's attended. Um, we will be uh, posting on YouTube um, this webinar, and you can also find some of Ruhi's other web webinars that she's done on nutrition and health. And um, all of that information is going to be available and um, you can access it if you follow us on social media. So we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter. Um, and then you can also go to our website and join our mailing list so that you get weekly newsletters that uh, provide links and information about our events. Um, so please do that. Um, and then you can look out for uh, more webinars with uh, Ruhi, inshallah. And again, all of that will be advertised on social media as well as in our weekly newsletters. So if you haven't already joined our mailing list, please do that on our website. Go to the website, uh, www.therahmafoundation.org and go to contact us. And then um, you can join the mailing list. And then you can also uh, look at previous recordings there on the website. And then and for anything new, uh, check out uh, our social media. So thank you guys for attending and thank you Ruhi for a great presentation. And with that, inshallah, we bid you. Assalamu alaikum. And we'll see you, inshallah, next time.